So very exciting to be here once again on a Friday, uh, talking about innovation, sustainability, what's going on in our area, who's doing what and why. So welcome to this first Friday Innovation Conversation of February. I'm really excited about the topic today and the speaker that we have. Actually, I'm excited about all the topics and speakers. So um, if you've missed any, you can always come back to this YouTube channel and watch the ones that happened before. Of course, you won't get to ask them questions on the spot like you will today, uh, which you can do by posting questions uh, on the chat in YouTube. I'll be watching that and uh, at, try to ask as many questions as I can uh, once our speaker is done. So this series actually evolved out of a um, person, like live face-to-face -face talk we would have with people, bringing them on campus to talk with us, inviting campus and community to come together to hear uh, from folks across the region about what they're doing. Of course, we're not bringing folks together face-to-face -to -face right now. Uh, so we thought, well, we've got all these speakers ready to share the really neat things that they're doing and folks that wanna hear about it, like you. So here we are in the virtual land. We're doing it on the first Fridays of every month. So we've got several left in this academic year through May. Uh, and these were people that um, we invited to apply. Um, wasn't really a targeted ask, but sort of a broad base ask about a year and a half ago. Uh, saying, hey, would you like to talk in our series? People applied to propose how they could talk about uh, interconnections of concepts relating to sustainability innovation. We actually had uh, students and faculty review the applications and give them blind scores uh, to see which one met the criteria and that they thought would be most interesting to, to hear and to have as part of the series. That said, we've got the speakers uh, that you'll see in this series that have happened and that uh, have yet to happen. Uh, so they come from campus and community. I'm ec really excited to say that this month we've got someone from our campus here at IU South Bend. Uh, someone, uh, all the transparency here, who was on my master's thesis committee. Thank you again for that. Um, but also is now my colleague. She is the director of the sustainability studies program here at IU South Bend, but more importantly, uh, is a biology professor with our biology program. And her research uh, in the interconnection of those two is what she'll be talking about today. So it's uh, my pleasure to introduce you to uh, Dr. Deb Marr. Take it away, Deb. Well, thank you for that introduction, Krista. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here so you can see my slides. And um, our landscapes can uh, do have a lot of roles for us. They can help support rich soils, clean water, clean air. But what I'm gonna focus on is their role in supporting biodiversity. And one of the um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals is to make cities inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. And so we need to really rethink our landscapes and how we're using them in our cities. Um, over 50% of the world's population lives in cities. Our cities are expanding. And so we have an opportunity to think about how we're using that land. Um, in 2019, the United Nations uh, had the first ever global biodiversity report the darker the red color means more than 40% biodiversity loss compared to an intact ecosystem. And one of the points that I wanna make here is that this biodiversity loss is not just happening somewhere else in the tropics or in Africa, but it's actually happening here. So if you look in the Midwest to the Plain States, between 30 to more than 40% biodiversity loss. Um, and on average, the abundance of native species in most terrestrial habitats is declining. You can see this in birds. So from the forested birds down to grassland birds, significant declines in North America. Um, this was a study in Germany. So looking at flying insect biomass. So every day they put out traps, captured all the flying insects, well, flying insects that were in these different 63 nature preserves from 1989 and then 2016. The blue dots are 1989, orange dots 2016. Take a look at this. So in 1989, 10 to 20 grams of flying insect biomass per day. By 2016, that had declined to less than two grams 
of biomass per day. So that's a decline of 75% or more over this 27 year time period. So huge declines in insects. And the major factors that are responsible is loss of habitat, decline in the quality of the habitat, as well as climate change. So what I wanna talk about is we can actually solve some of these problems or at least help reduce some of this biodiversity loss. Um, one of the most important things is including more native plants in our urban landscapes. And the reason why this is important is because native plants have historically occurred within the region. They support a more complex web of life. Non-native plants, so the majority of our horticultural plants that we use in urban landscapes are non-native. They've been introduced to the area and they just don't support as much life. And then of course, there's also invasive plants which are a whole nother problem unto themselves, but they're not normally part of the ecosystem. And they actually cause harm um, to other organisms in a variety of ways in areas. And the reason why native plants matter is that every single plant species has its own plant chemistry, specific plant chemistry. And the animals feeding on those plants have evolved over long periods of time to have a specific suite of interactions that they can have. So animals can't just eat any old plant, just like we can't just eat any old plant. Um, and so this plant chemistry really matters. Um, one of the studies that we've done on campus um, is actually comparing the amount of arthropods and insects and birds occurring in these parking lot islands. Um, so parking lot islands that have horticultural plants that are mostly non-native, as well as parking lot islands that have mostly native plants. And one of the things that we've observed is that for bird species, so these top eight species here were found in both parking lot types. But in the, plant, the parking lots with native plants, we picked up four additional bird species and notice that two of them primarily get their diet from insects, they're insectivores. And if we look at the comparison of, of bird abundance, this was particularly amazing. So these parking lot uh, islands are just adjacent to each other, but four times more birds in the parking lot islands with native plants compared to the non-native plants. And part of this has to do with there's more food for them. We, had, we uh, recorded two times more arthropods. There were more floral visitors and all of that supported higher trophic levels of birds in this case. So um, another question that kind of comes up is that uh, what is a pollinator friendly plant? So maybe you're looking for native plants and often they're advertised as being pollinator friendly. So what do we mean by that? Um, it's a kind of a vague term and it can mean a lot of things. But on campus, one of the studies that we've been done, so um, Andy Schnabel is another professor in the biology department and he and I have been working with students over the last three to four years or so tracking pollinator diversity for different uh, plants. Um, so this is an example of six of the species that we've been tracking. Um, and we record the floral visitors that are coming to them. And one of the things that we've found is that some of these plant species, so for example, swamp milkweed and the irises, they really get a diversity. So they get butterflies and bugs, uh, flies and bees and so forth. Um, whereas others like beard's tongue, so penstemon, mostly bees. Um, Tradescantia, so this is spiderwort, so bees and flies. Um, and then other things like physostegia and cup plant, um, mostly bees, but all of them are attracting pollinators, but they all have their own different community of pollinators that they're attracting. Um, this last summer, two particular species that we were tracking are both in the mint family. They're cousins, if you will. Uh, so one is mountain mint. And look at this. So mountain mint, 60% wasps, 23% bees. And if you look at the wasps, a pretty good diversity of wasps, as well as a pretty good diversity of bees. So that's mountain mint. If we look at another mint, so obedient plant or physostegia, almost all bees, hardly any wasps at all, 80% bees. And if you look at the bees, a really good diversity of bees are coming, uh, are visiting and pollinating uh, this particular plant. 
We also have plants uh, on campus. So in one of the wetlands, uh, we have Lysomachia ciliata. So this is the fringe yellow loosestrife. This one's supporting specialized oil bees. So unlike going for nectar or pollen, they're actually foraging for the floral oils. So they're a relatively unusual bee, but we have it in our on our campus because we've got the plants. So you can kind of create these specialized habitats that are conservation hotspots for pollinators even if you're in an urban setting. Um, so all of these plants are um, pollinator friendly, but they all have their own different community attracting a diversity of native bees. Um, and the other thing that I should point out is that we, we need to think more than just about bees. Bees are kind of like the charismatic fauna. They're the polar bears or the koala bears or the sea otters of our system. But it's more than just bees that we need to care about. It's really the whole web of life. So these plants are supporting not just pollinators, but they're also supporting predators, um, herbivores, parasites, and then a whole suite of microbes along with them. So we really need to be thinking about that whole web of life that we want to support. So it matters what we plant to more than just pollinators. This was a study um, that was comparing bee balm, which is a native plant, and comparing the straight wild species that you would normally find in natural habitats to a cultivar that had been bred to have darker colored, sort of reddish colored leaves and fancier flowers. Um, and they tracked hemipteran species. So these are true bugs. So they looked at 63, 64 species of hemipteran. So things like plant hoppers and leaf hoppers that are mostly feeding on the leaves. And they found that over 50% of those hemipterans preferred the straight species, the normal species, compared to the cultivar. So all that fancy breeding of getting these different colored leaves and fancier flowers, the bugs don't like it. So when possible, straight species is probably the way to go. In some cases, it, uh, there was no difference between the two, but in some cases, it mattered. Another thing that we wanna do is increase plant density and plant diversity. So no more social distancing of plants. Um, there was an interesting study in um, Chicago where they compared in urban Chicago, what was the abundance and diversity of bees compared to the suburbs surrounding Chicago. Uh, I find this particularly fascinating because we normally think of um, cities as concrete jungles and not supporting biodiversity. Um, and what they did is they identified 25 neighborhoods. They went to these neighborhoods, they did pollinator observations, but they also set out these purple cone flowers. So Echinacea purpurea. And they set out these uh, cone flowers as a way of measuring bee abundance and bee diversity in these 25 neighborhoods. So here's what they found. So they've got the Chicago city boundary here. We have Lake Michigan over here. The darker the color, is the denser, the more people living in that neighborhood, the larger the circle, the more bees. And the more, the higher bee abundance was also associated with more bee species. And look at this, more people, more bees, larger circles. So why is this? So in these, um, if you look at these urban areas, they have more floral resources. People do different things and the more diverse the neighborhood and the higher density, some were planting garden plants on their balconies, some were doing different potted plants, but people like to grow different things. So there was a greater diversity of floral resources for these bees. Whereas if you compare this to the suburbs, we see more homogeneous, homogenization of the landscape, more lawns, more mulch, less diversity in the flowers. Um, the, there was another study that was actually interesting as well there was higher bee abundance and bee diversity in low socioeconomic poor neighborhoods compared to richer neighborhoods. Because in the richer neighborhoods, people were able, they hired professional landscaping services. So they sprayed more pesticides. They had more of this lush green lawn that was homogenous, fewer dandelions, fewer, less clover and so forth. Um, so interestingly, letting things go a little bit and being a little less particular about having this perfect green lawn can be helpful to the bees. In addition, Chicago has taken on an initiative to increase their rooftop gardens. 
Um, so currently there's over 500 rooftop gardens and 13 rooftop farms. All of this increases the floral diversity. Now it turns out these rooftop gardens don't support as much floral, um, as much pollinators compared to the parks and prairies that are on the ground, but still it is a resource and they are finding significant diversity. And um, for the rooftop gardens, several of them have focused on um, planting native plants. Um, and not just anything. So some are farms, gardens, and so forth. But this is increasing the floral resources within the city of Chicago. So now I want to turn to the ground layer. Um, we really need to rethink how we think about the ecology of our ground layer. We need to leave the leaves and we need to increase our winter vegetation. And the reason for that is that the leaves um, contribute to nutrient cycling. So getting nutrients back into the ground through decomposition, but they're also providing little pockets of habitat where all these arthropods and insects overwinter. This provides food for birds in the winter time, um, but it also allows those insects to carry out their normal life cycle. So if you mulch up your leaves and run your lawnmower over this, it speeds up the nutrient cycling process, but you're also chopping up all those insects and decreasing the amount of food for the birds, but it also they can't finish out their life cycle. Um, and so we really need to leave the stalks, sort of normalize letting our vegetation be over the winter time so that these insects can complete their life cycle. So for example, the caterpillars of the dusky skipper butterfly, um, they, their caterpillars actually overwinter in little blue stem over the winter. Um, and so there's these relationships between different species that are overwintering in our plants. Um, one that I particularly like, so this is yucca filamentosa. So in the summertime, it flowers in June in our area and it gets pollinated by moths. But there's also another moth species that lays her eggs in the stem. And then these eggs hatch into larvae, which overwinter in the stalks. So if you take a look at these stalks in the winter time, um, so this is uh, one of the stalks here. If you look at the upper part, you can see these holes. Um, and then the lower part has been completely uh, torn apart here. In our yard, it's the woodpeckers, nuthatches, and chickadees that mainly seem to do this, although we haven't quite figured out this bottom part might be the squirrels that are also going after this food resource. But there's this whole cycle that's happening in the wintertime of these stalks where the insects can complete their life cycle, but it's also providing food for other organisms that are in that habitat. So the way we design and maintain our landscapes reflects our understanding of the ecosystems. It shows our history, our culture, and our values. Um, we have the opportunity to make our yards, our balconies, containers on our patios a conservation hotspot, at least for the pollinators. It doesn't solve the larger organisms such as wolves and so forth, but at least for the pollinators and the insects, we can really make a difference. So a couple key things, plant native plants whenever possible, embrace plant density and diversity, reduce the use of pesticides, reduce your fall cleanup efforts, less raking, clean off your sidewalks, clean up, you know, so you don't get stormwater management issues, but as much as possible, keep the leaves whole. We also need to think about our social norms. How can we celebrate the diversity of our landscapes and celebrate the people in our neighborhoods so that we can maintain that diversity and not get that homogenization where everything looks the same? A one wonderful resource that I'll leave you with is the floor of the Chicago region. If you're really into this stuff, it's over a thousand pages. It's a tome but it's got all these plant species. You can look up their conservation value, but it also has kind of the, all the plants that you normally find them with in a natural habitat. So you could create a little oasis in your garden, trying to recreate a natural network, ecological network in your yard. So this is a wonderful resource. Um, I also have a whole bunch of resources that I'll share with Krista that she can put out. Um, we have a lot of wonderful uh, local organizations about native plants, places to get native plants. Um, and then there's also some really great uh, national organizations. So a homegrown national parks program where you can actually
get your landscape into that network. We're trying to create an ecological, well, find out more about the ecological networks across the nation. So this is a really wonderful program. And the Missouri Botanical Garden has great resources for doing container gardening with native plants. So if all you have is a balcony or a front stoop, you can still make a difference. So I wanna thank my collaborators and I'll stop there for questions. Oh, it's just so interesting, Deb. Thank you so much. Um, it's a lot of information though. And I see we've already got a couple of questions coming in and I know I definitely have some as well. Um, so uh, let's see where to begin. Uh, well, first, <laughs> I love that you were talking about the, the yucca plant. Now that's a native, right? Yes. And I, I actually was uh, caught Deb the other day stalking some yucca stalks uh, <laughs> on campus looking for just what she was sharing there. Uh, I had never heard of this before. So now I'm going to be doing some whole new uh, sort of winter nature watching uh, in my own yard and on campus. So that's really fascinating. Thanks for sharing all this stuff to look for. And I think probably what a lot of folks are going to be excited about what you said is to do less work. <laughs> <laughs> Less raking, no more leaf flowing. Yeah. So, I mean, you do want to rake, of course, you want to clear your sidewalks and you want to clear the road so it doesn't get into the stormwater drains. But move those leaves up onto your gardens if you can. So, um, and the thing is, if leave the leaves whole. So, kind of minimize raking as much as possible. Uh, yeah. And it, it makes a difference in terms of the insects. The other thing that I want to say about the yuccas, they're actually, so they're native to the southeastern U.S., but they've spread up into this region. And some of the, as they've spread up, some of their, their they've brought their community with them. Uh, so we have a simpler community up here compared to what they have down in Florida uh, and Tennessee, but it's still here. Interesting how they, they move with community, much like people do, right? Yes. Go to one spot pretty soon, your family starts visiting and settling <laughs> in with you. And then you've got a whole little transplanted community. Um, but I love this idea of just like letting things go um, and leaving the leaves uh, because it's good for the earth. Yeah. And it's easier on us and we can and do more um, nature observations throughout the year and enjoy the yard in a, in a whole new way. So you focused in on like what to plant uh, on really focusing on those native cultivars, which I thought was really interesting looking at the difference between those two, but also this idea that just because we live in a city, which most people in the world do, yes, that's actually been not a bad thing for a whole range of pollinators. That's yeah. really fascinating that like you said just put a pot on the porch and you can make a difference but can you speak briefly I know you talked about pollinators being more than bees which make people nervous uh, but there's more to be watching for so what can they do if maybe they are allergic to bee stings is this something they should be aware of when they're putting um, plants in their yard or on their porch so in terms of uh, container gardening and that kind of thing I think the threat of bee stings is pretty low. Mostly you get, so most of our native bees are solitary bees. And uh, so they can ground nest and nest in, in wood cavities, which we also have and bare ground, which in urban habitats, we actually have more bare ground, uh, which is one of the reasons why these solitary bees tend to sometimes do better in cities than they do in, in rural areas. Um, so these bees for the most part don't sting. Most of the time when I've encountered bee sting is actually with a uh, yellow jacket and wasps. And as the season progresses, particularly towards August and September, they get more territorial. And it tends to be more like if you step on like a wasp nest unintentionally, that tends to be when you get stung. But the bees visiting the flowers. Um, so we spend a lot of time really up close watching plants. None of, none of us have gotten stung. Uh, from doing that. So the bees are focused on that. Now, if you go poking at it, I suppose there might be a risk. Um, and I should also say the wasps. Uh, so also those are not, you could get stung by a wasp, but they're focused on the flowers. Um, and so it's not so much a threat to people. If you're severely allergic to bees, go for the grasses. So one of the things, so sedges and grasses, so they're not really gonna be attracting the pollinators so much, but they're important habitat for a lot of butterfly and moths. 
that are overwintering in those stems. So if you're really concerned about bee stings, then go for the grasses and sedges, which are underloved. <laughs> so that hits on one of the questions that's been posted. So if you're going for the grasses and you're leaving these stems up because you're like, hey, she said to leave it, don't work hard. But when do you cut them back? I mean, at some point you have to remove those dead stems, right? When do you do that? Yeah, so, um, so I've been experimenting with this in my yard. I do it in April and May. Um, so I try to get it, let, leave it as long as possible so that the insects have a chance to emerge. So in our area, usually by April, it's warm enough that the insects are starting to emerge. You can cut back. There will be less of a threat of um, frost and so forth. So I would say April or May. Um, it's probably going to be different. You know, there's not a lot known about these insects that are overwintering in these stems. There's a lot fewer studies. So uh, I've just been experimenting. And so that's what I've been doing. And so usually if you do April or May, it's before the new growth comes up. So it's pretty easy to chop down. Great. That's really helpful. Thanks. Um, other questions that are coming in. Um, also clarifying about bees, that the social bees will be more defensive and likely to sting. But like you said, our natives tend to be more solitary. And we're not interesting. We're not food. So yeah, great, great point. Um, but what, um, what might it be in our area that is acting against biodiversity? And a related comment about the map you showed with the Midwest having a lot of red, is that because of agriculture? Is it because of suburbanization? Um, what's it's, acting against biodiversity here? So in the Plains states, so in the Midwest and the Plains, most of that has to do with agriculture. So we've had tremendous change in habitat loss. So within Indiana, I think we've lost 85% of our wetlands, 90% uh, of our forests. So it's just this huge shift in natural landscaping, shifting to agriculture, but also increased urbanization. So if you think about South Bend, Mishawaka, our whole area, it's expanded over, you know, I've lived here about 20 years now and it's expanded uh, you know, quite a bit just within that time period. And of course, if you look over the last hundred years has expanded uh, quite a bit. So part of it is expanding cities um, and then also agriculture. So that change in habitat land use is one of the major factors. So is there any like driving commercial reasons that are contributing to this? Are we seeing more agriculture, more development? What, what do you think is kind of one of the big threats. I'm trying to make sure I'm hitting this person's question well enough. Yeah. And I'm really curious like, um, what's acting against this. Here. So in the agriculture section, one of the biggest things, so actually one of the reasons why cities are becoming a pollinator hotspot hot over the rural areas is that in the rural areas, agriculture, at least in the U.S., has shifted to really being more monoculture. So it's like entire fields of just corn or just soybeans alternating between years, but still really, and then really getting rid of the weeds. So there used to be more um, hedgerows and patches in between farms, but a lot of that's gone away. So part of the rural areas is that uh, widespread use of both systemic pesticides, um, but also a lot of homogenization of the landscape. And actually, if you look at aerial photographs, you can see it in our area. If you drive out of the city, uh, it's, um, you know, the croplands are, don't have a lot of other things growing around them, not as much as usual. Within the cities, um, it's also decreasing the diversity of the landscape. So this is where I think really celebrating people doing different things, let your neighbor be different from you and celebrate that. And I'm not sure how we get that out, but uh, that from the city studies, um, and this is true of Detroit and St. Louis and Chicago. I just showed the Chicago study, uh, but that diversity of floral resources and diversity of people uh, helps, helps the pollinators anyway. That's great. Um, so we've got, I'm gonna put a last call out for questions to get posted on YouTube. I did have a comment here that maybe we can um, look a little deeper at uh, really the biodiversity issue of the week here in Indiana. Um, and mm -hmm. that's our, our wetland protection on private lands. I know we've got some restored wetlands on our campus that you were highlighting, uh, but one person commented about um, new development, the, the casino on the southwest part of town was oh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. a wet area um, and that ha has displaced a lot of creatures. So maybe you can speak a little bit to 
wetland protection. I mean, this is an urban landscape. It's kind of hard for me to put a wetland in my yard, but uh, what, any thoughts on that? Um, so I think one of the things that would be really useful sort of at the city planning level is that as we're rethinking our city, so in the case of South Bend, we're actually shrinking. In some cases, we have uh, empty lots. Um, and um, so as we kind of rethink the city or if we're expanding the city, really rethinking how we use that landscape wisely, uh, there's, I, I don't know that there's a really good single answer to this, but allowing wetlands to occur within cities um, in the case as, and as much as possible, allowing, you know, wetlands to exist so on campus, we're in urban area, uh, we were able to put in those wetlands and that's had, uh, contributes to better water quality. So it reduces the amount of runoff going into the river. So that helps maintain our river. So we can really think about that river corridor and the riparian zone. So the land on either side of that river, and if we can really kind of revegetate that, that could make a huge difference. Um, and then also we need to think very carefully about the rural areas and that existing farmland. That's actually an important resource and we need to protect it as much as possible. Um, and we just need to keep having these conversations between city planners um, and sort of thinking about multifaceted levels of need. Mm. And, and it's all important for having a healthy city because it contributes to our, you know, clean air, clean water, but also just life, so. Sure, so I guess um, I'm not seeing anything get posted here, uh, but I'll take the, before we kind of closing things out today, um, you mentioned the values that would support this. What kind of values do we need to have uh, stronger or to, to revitalize to help support some of these initiatives you've outlined? Uh, well, I think one thing is, maybe supporting each other more. So I, there seems to be a lot of social pressure in neighborhoods to have a lush green lawn that is uh, just lawn, no dandelions, no clover or anything. And so, you know, sort of changing some of those social norms uh, towards allowing greater diversity in our lawns, increasing native plants wherever possible um, and allowing our neighbors to do different things. Um, so I don't know, I, yeah, we need to bring in the sociologists and the psychologists more on this one, I think. Well, thank you so much for a really interesting talk. I trust that people uh, learned a few new things. I know I did, and I've heard you talk about this a lot. So thank you uh, so much for sharing the delightful pictures and insights and, and thoughts on this. Um, as I mentioned, as we started, we're doing this every